Ladies and gentlemen, so good to see you again. I haven't seen you in this class for a while. Um, before we start uh, the class, uh, let me remind you that we all in special circumstances uh, each year by special rules. And you might be surprised, uh, but according to exact interpretation of these rules, You've got to wear masks now. Uh, I don't want to police you, do whatever you want. But just as a teacher, one of my responsibilities is to remind you about it. I, you would excuse me if I don't wear a mask because it kind of inhibits my speaking abilities. Uh, fine. Welcome. Welcome to the course of advanced quantum mechanics, uh, which has a reputation of rather difficult course. That's why let us immediately get the most difficult part of this course. Let me outline the limitation. First of all, we are a team of four. I'm Yuli, I'm responsible for the lectures. Miriam, Max, Mihail, Mihail is here, the instructors, they will, uh, we will uh, um, lead you together to a happy end of this course. What are activities we're going to do? First of all, let us hang up one. We will have lectures, 12 lectures given by me, yeah, provided I kind of stay alive till the end of semester. And, uh, well, uh, there was a book and lectures are given by the book. Don't expect anything which is not good. Right. Any questions about this? I guess it's pretty standard. The difficulty is that this year we will give it in mixed format, Zoom, and uh, plus small things. In the beginning, there are technical difficulties, difficult. Um, we will explain it. It doesn't go pretty good. By the way, can everybody hear me distinctly? including Zoom participants. Silence. Uh, all right, I hope you do. Somebody who doesn't hear me respond. Um, good, uh, lectures. That will be on Thursdays, as you see in your schedule. On Mondays, we will have problem solving sessions. Various activities are there. Uh, one of the activities are presentations by instructors. We will look in detail on some problems, methods, um, how to solve this. Um, there will be like uh, five, six presentations. Oh my um, in addition to that, you have, you have homework, right? And there will be sessions when we have a supervised homework, meaning we are in class in Zoom and we will answer your questions after formulating the problem, explaining the formulation once again. Supervised homework, and we will have explaining homework sessions, basically after each homework the right. Homework, um, yeah, we are here now. There are four packages of homework, 10 problems in total. My two submitted to Brightspace. We check this, we got some feedback through um, Brightspace. And homework accounts for 15% of final grade. 
Good, so the homework will be explained after each session. Um, as response of some criticism of uh, previous generations, we do not provide solutions or homework. Please don't expect this from us. Uh, there is a problem on the AMC. No, the actual. Say it again. They do not see the actual slides, but they zoom out. They don't see this. That's strange. Um, okay. Show screen. Is it better now? Fine. Good. Zoom participants, you are really uh, uh, okay. You might react to that. Um, anyway, what I uh, wanted to say about uh, the structure. Um, in addition to homework, we have presentations, which is an important part of the course. And uh, the part which you have to do uh, yourself with the help of the structure, it's important organization moment that you have to form groups of five in order to get presentation assigned to you, in order to collaborate, make it done, and present. So, in order to form a group, please uh, make it group of five and write to Miriam. She will take care of this. Please do it. If you want to do it with your friends, please do it before 1st of March. Please take care of this pickups yet today. We need to form the groups of five. Sometimes everybody will get presentation. Miriam will schedule presentations. That will be separate schedule. Not on Mondays, not on Thursdays. Some other dates we will be told. Presentations, also important activity in this course. Uh, good, this all of them, we come with them. Uh, the exam, you have conversions. Difficult one and easy one. Easy one for those who have made the presentations. Uh, some of you find this course so nice as to repeat it. So last year, those who did presentation last year, it counts. Don't bother about this year. Uh, right, uh, then what else? I guess I'm done with the organization. Any questions? Zoom participants? Or there something in church? Do you want to form groups till uh, beginning of March, just as much? That is a uh, uh, deadline. Then you would be kind of uh, forcibly uh, assigned to the groups. The rest of you, which requires lots of uh, fuss. So we do prefer that you're kind of mature enough to organize these groups by yourself. Please do it till the rest of March. Uh, it's interesting that Zoom participants are way more active. Uh, interesting. Very good. Uh, the question was, do we pick uh, the presentation. Yes, you pick the presentation. Just the, form the group, then pick the presentation from the list. You can find the presentations in the right space. Check with Miriam if it's not taken. Sir, you need to confirm it with Miriam. 
Yeah. Um, fine, sir. If there are no questions, uh, let me get another view of the course. It's all presentation, it's all boring. Uh, let me tell you about the idea of the course and what you would have to do and what can be difficult to do in this course. Right. Uh, you are students of Delft University of Technology. You are its markers. In positive sense of this word, you're engineers. Engineering applied to very fancy objects, advanced quantum mechanics, is taught here roughly as a course on engineering. Something to do, not you know, just imagine uh, about uh, um, think about the structure of the universe. You know, the course is different. Okay, how would do? How would we fix our bike? How we engineer, we do it with some tool sets, with some motions. For instance, we use screwdrivers. Right? What I will teach you is also a tool set. You all took to usual quantum mechanics. That was also a set of tools. Wave functions, states, equations, right? They look pretty mathematical. It doesn't look like a screwdriver, but in fact, it works precisely like this. You apply it. You apply it to find answer on the questions to make something new out of quantum mechanical systems. A tool set. Here, some people uh, like to think about fascination, the ultimate sense of quantum mechanics, life is so it's not different. Go on with this. It's not our task. The engineers, we use it as a tool set. What's the problem with this tool set? If you take screwdriver first time in your hand, it's difficult. It requires some exercise, uh, uh, exercise of fine muscles in your hand. Same here. There will be more many calculations. They will be simple as far as I'm concerned. Um, but many, you really have to do it yourself. Why? Right. Suppose we study not want to be kind by screwdriving. Look, I could screw, uh, I could screw millions of screws during the lecture. If you don't try to do it yourself, you would never learn it. Agree? Fine. Which means that you would have to do yourself lots of simple calculations. To do it until uh, Still some skill. There will be large sums with many indices, don't mess indices. There will be integrals like dx dx squared. Don't Google it. Do it yourself. You can do this. That's why we have presentations next to homework. Homework is an absolute minimum of the skills. Some people have a delusion, I did homework, I should perform well in the examination. Homework is an absolute minimum, just to go through examination, not to do it. Right? That's why we have presentations where the same tool set is used in a bit more active manner. Right? So analogy with screw set. Another analogy which I have is learning and dancing. Suppose I teach dancing, I could dance against you or two others. If you don't move, you, you would not learn anything. Right. 
So please do it. Please, if you're into calls, try to exercise small mathematical muscles. We have try to make it stronger. Try to understand what are you doing because everything is an activity. It's not humanities that we have to learn and memorize things. This is something for engineers. This is something to do. Wow, that was a good introduction. I hope you're not scared. Let me get to more specific introductions. Uh, uh, let me get to the course. And somehow it doesn't work. Right, there will be topics, rather distinct topics. We will go from that. First topic, which I don't touch now, will be second quantization, very technical. Many people got bored at this spot. Just take, take uh, care, take patience. Uh, it will be very helpful. It's again a tool set, something to exercise you to find muscles. Then we go to condensed matter examples, uh, something from solid state physics, you might remember. We look at magnets, superconductors, superfluids. Then we turn to the fields, from particles to fields. We will talk about fields and radiation, about uh, whatever Cherenkov, uh, about um, emission of light by atoms, all things like that. We will learn a lot. Then there was a unique part of this course, which is not usually taught, despite of its practical significance, dissipative quantum mechanics. We will learn how quantum mechanical systems behave itself in the presence of friction, in the presence of dissipation. And there will be only a single lecture, since we are all engineers, Initially, I thought, well, I'd better skip it, but my colleagues told me, please don't do this, please don't skip relativistic mechanics. Who knows, perhaps in 10 years, engineering will go to speed of light. All right, so I give this lecture direct equation in the course. Those are subtropics. Um, More detailed overview, perhaps, uh, or is it premature, whatever, just to mention that first lecture, we will just refresh quantum mecha uh, uh, mechanics, which is prerequisite of this course, you have to know this. So we will repeat, refresh everything which we have to know about quantum mechanics. Then there will be second quantization to lectures. Identical particles uh, uh, and uh, creation relation apparatus, um, condensed matter examples, fields, dissipative quantum mechanics, and last lecture will be about relativistic work. So that's short overview. Any questions about this general picture? Because I'm gonna switch to the material of this lecture, I'm gonna refresh usual quantum mechanics. Ah, perhaps Zoom participants can help me with the question. Uh, fine. It's last question that I used to. Uh, is there a special day today, Blue Monday? Whatever. Um, just uh, uh, to let you know that I like questions. And if you're also practical, if you would think at some moment, or oh, this guy just uh, tells nuts, uh, says not nonsense, it's not really so. It means that we have misunderstanding. So please, at this point, don't hesitate. To stand up, whichever to ask question, and I will emulate it. I will uh, do 
ever seem to be as comprehensive as possible. Fine. No questions. Let me start with a um, reflection. And let me start with classical mechanics, classical mechanics of a single particle, which you have forgotten perhaps. It's your first year. So you have a particle. It's also an abstraction to a kind of massive body, but it's a good uh, um, abstraction. And for the particle, the state of the particle is completely determined by three times two by six numbers, three components of momentum, three components of coordinate vector. Right. It's important to understand that classical mechanics is governed by evolution equations. Derivative of momentum is a force, and force, potential force, is a function of coordinates. Derivative of uh, coordinate is velocity. It is a function of momentum. What does it mean? If we know momenta and uh, coordinates in a given moment of time, we can predict what happens in another close moment of time. We could put it to computer, which computes derivatives and updates the variables step by step. Evolution. Fine, which kind of had philosophical consequences, right? Imagine that, you know, the coordinates and the momenta of all <coughs> particles in the beginning of the universe, then we can predict everything which will happen in this universe in its end. The complete determinism, predestination, let's say. Well, uh, one can argue to which extent it is true, because it's not practical, it's not for engineers, I should never know that much. Nevertheless, it uh, implies a certain picture of very deterministic world, like absolute monarchy of 18th century. Fine. Okay, let me divide that we derive these equations or equations in a bit different way, which is one of uh, five or seven ways with which you can derive it in classical mechanics. Let me take this, let me take Hamiltonian formulation. My question who recalls Hamiltonian formulation in the context of classical mechanics. Right, some of you do. So how does it work? We have a function, generally a function of two um, vectors, momentum and coordinate. And we form equations in such a way. And the derivative of momentum is the derivative of Hamiltonian with the spectral coordinate, is minus sign. Uh, if I were a student, I would put minus sign here as well, but it's important just to know for homogeneity. But it's important that we here we have plus. Right. So Hamiltonian, which takes this form. P squared over 2m, this is kinetic energy, and uh, something which depends on coordinates, this is potential energy. All right, you differentiated your uh, form equations. It is uh, just applying these formulas. It's easy to understand that the Hamiltonian function itself, itself 
does not change upon evolution. So we have energy conservation. If all the values this energy function, is energy. Fine, that was short introduction into classical mechanics. If there are no questions, let's go further. Ready? Schrodinger equation, I will jump to Schrodinger equation, but first I would like to discuss this equation for what? For what variable? They say it's wave function. For one particle, this is a function of coordinates, which also depends on time. And they say, they told us, it's kind of a paradigm of quantum mechanics, that this function actually determines the state of the particle. It's a function, so there's a complex number in each point of space. So it has very, very many parameters, much more parameters than six parameters to characterize the state of classical particle. Very strange. How does it work? It works that, uh, in fact, our theory becomes probabilistic. We are down with the determinism. We are never able not only predict, but even determine coordinates and momenta. If you measure it, you got a statistical result of your measurement. Or kind of um, an enterprise or an engineer would say, well, it's a large memory resource. One can use wave functions to memorize kind of lots and lots of information. Well, unfortunately, it's not so. It would have been wonderful if it is so. But if you measure this wave function, if you try to extract information from wave function, it arises, it has to rise. So any attempt to characterize this, uh, the to characterize a wave function eventually erases this rich information. Fine. Good. I hope you have heard about this. It's still refreshing of quantum mechanics. If you have a question, this please do now. Would be your last chance to know. Uh, all right, fine. Let me recall something useful. Uh, sir, how about probabilities? The probability to find a particle at the point R is given by modulus square of the wave function. You know, clouds uh, which you um, usually encounter when we discuss atoms, kind of electrons in atoms from clouds uh, with some distribution. Uh, it's important that you surely will find a particle somewhere. Probability of this is one. That's why the sum or integral of these probabilities must be one. Right? Normalization property of wave function. Interesting uh, question to you, which you will answer a little bit later. Well, now we know the probabilities of coordinates. How about the probabilities to have a certain momentum. It would be useful if you just recall it now in your head. We will come to this a little bit later. Try to recall how to get probabilities 
uh, to be in a certain um, momentum state. Right. So it's about wave function. Let me uh, let me cite Schrodinger equation. So Erwin Schrodinger, German professor, by time of deriving this equation was kind of a solid established person of about my age, perhaps a bit younger. Um, and uh, the equation he wrote resembled very much equations which were in fashion in 19th century. It's a, uh, an equation in partial derivatives. We find their partial derivative with respect to time, partial derivative with respect to coordinates. Right? And the quantity we look at by itself depends on time. Similar questions uh, you can uh, derive and apply, for instance, for uh, propagation of heat in, uh, in uh, some three dimensional geometries for hydrodynamics. All these equations are equations in partial derivatives. So I can just tweak what we, what people knew at the time, and just um, adjust it for wave function. Good. What is the structure of this equation in general? It's a evolution equation. So in fact, in the equation, it's about time derivative of a function. This time derivative is a function which is obtained by applying an operator on the function. An operator is something which takes function, returns function. All right. So how this uh, operator, how this Hamiltonian operator is made? In fact, it consists of two classical parts, which in quantum mechanics look a bit different. Well, first of all, it's multiplication with potential energy, right? And second, kinetic energy arises in terms of second derivatives. One can argue that this is the same kinetic energy squared of momentum operator divided by 2m, but momentum operator is a derivative. Fine. We have inflation of this form, which is principle solid. And it's also, look, it's also deterministic. Let's see how it works. It works like clockwork if we know a function and the beginning of universe. We could apply this equation and compute it step by step till the end of universe. So in this sense, it's pretty deterministic. But if you begin to measure it all collapses. You change the function and uh, you cannot predict the results of measurement. So there is some duality. From one hand, one can easily compute the wave function. From the other hand, you cannot really use it to predict the measurement results. What is usual to do with this time-dependent equation is to make it time independent. And how to do this if the Hamiltonian, and it's frequently so, does not depend on time explicitly. One can look for other solutions in this form. So this is time independent, and this is a simple time dependent phase factor. 
uh, energy comes here. So one substitutes it into short equation. And that's perhaps first exercise for you little mathematical muscles. Don't be lazy, substitute it at home. Right? One substitutes it and one gets energy on this part. On this part. And uh, right, Hamiltonian on this part. So it becomes uh, eigenvalue equation. In other terms, eigenvalues of this operator um, are energy levels of quantum system. Fine. Let's see how I'm doing with respect to time. So for the goods, so, all right, there's some discussion in chat, but um, not here. Um, anyway, showing equation. Let me talk more about physical quantity. Let me talk about operators and observables. We have already seen that a momentum, physical quantity, becomes an operator. It's a operator for derivative. If you take function, you differentiate it, you get another function. Operator, epsilon function, returns a function. Uh, that's all fine. It's an uh, operator. So not special wave functions for reach. If you act with a operator, you just get a factor, which is eigenvalue of this operator. Right? For instance, yes, eigenfunctions of momentum. Those are plane waves. I can function of coordinated something concentrated in the point. I can function of momentum is a wave function which is spread over the whole space. With certain phase factor, with certain momentum. So if I'm x with a operator p on this function that gets a number, one gets a number corresponding to here. Perhaps it's better to put zeros here. So, the same function times a number. Fine. And the story is that it's not something special about momentum. It means that all physical quantities, most all physical quantities, are in fact operators. Are quantum mechanical operators. Strangely enough. Right? And uh, those are emission operators. So A uh, dagger is uh, A. And that guarantees that physical numbers are real. For instance, eigenvalues of an emission operators are real. It is a traditional concept of measurement. In order to measure wave function, you kind of measure it with an operator, you project it on eigenfunctions of a certain operator. Then you get stochastic uh, readings corresponding to eigenvalues of this operator. There's some probability which uh, are given by a projection of wave function on the eigenfunction of this operator. Good. Sir, any physical quantity is an operator. What is of special importance for us is what we call expectation value. In terms of probability, it's just an average of this probability distribution. 
But in quantum mechanics, it also has some practical value because, well, uh, so measurements and measurements. And uh, not every practical measurement is a measurement from textbooks. And as far as practical measurements are concerned, frequently we just measure expectation value. Expectation value is important. How do we compute it given operators, operator and wave functions? Okay, we kind of break it this operator. Uh, we take wave function, we act on it as operator, and then we bring complex conjugated wave function. You see how I, just, I exercise my mathematical muscles? Right? We do it. Wave function, operator, another wave function, and integration. This is expectation. So for any operator, for any wave function, we can determine this. Right? Operators, observables. Let me see what can I do before the break. Uh, right, uh, there was a question in Zoom. Is it only eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian that have the simple phase factor time evolution? Those are eigenfunctions of stationary Hamiltonian, which does not depend on time explicitly. If it's stationary, then it's guaranteed that all time dependent functions will have such simple time dependence. Uh, right, so before the blank. We will refresh the right simulation, which has happened uh, uh, just several years after the formulation of Schrodinger derivation. But that was Dirac by the time, quite a young person, perhaps a couple of years old as you. So he got some new, new ideas, and that formulation was really a revolution. Also, very much abstract, you really had to get some mass at school in order to come up with this. So what's the formulation? Wave function appears to be not a function, but rather a vector in some multi-dimensional space, which is called Hilbert space. So it's like a vector. It always comes into, uh, how would I say, uh, sides, bra and cat. They call it in quantum mechanics, which means wave function itself and conjugated of this wave function. What's important uh, for Hilbert space? In Hilbert space, we always have in the product, scalar product of two vectors. Remember cosine uh, of uh, angle between the vectors if you get it to geometrical uh, minutes in the product. Fine. What's a Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian is an operator, linear operator. That's also important. That was, uh, I would not live in a world where quantum mechanics is not linear. That, that's terrible. So let's not do it. Quantum mechanics is linear, linear science. So all Hamiltonians do not depend on wave function and equations are, are linear. Linear emission operators. Again, operator it takes a vector, the transvectors of each operator is in fact matrix. That's why it's been called matrix quantum mechanics. Right, vectors. When dealing with vectors, 
and I will talk about in a minute, uh, we need a basis. What is a basis? It's also geometrical meaning. What would be coordinate system in three dimensional space? Three vectors which are orthogonal to each other. Same here. In this multi dimensional space, we will have bases, we will have systems, sets of orthogonal vectors, uh, which are like perpendicular with respect to each other, orthogonal, and they are of unit lines. Right, that's main aspect concepts of the right formulation. Wave function becomes vector, Hamiltonian becomes a matrix, and we have bad basis. Yes, please. It's like each vector in Hilbert space come, can come into representations, like bra uh, and cat. It's the same vector, but you just use it differently. Yeah, I usually have in mind a, a picture of wave function and conjugated wave function. That's more convenient. It's the same function, but you just look at it. You can use either wave function or its country. All right. So sets. The question was what? Uh, sets and basis. Uh, let us see. Let's have a eight minute break for a change. Very good. So, matrix of oh, matrix uh, quantum mechanics, the right formulation. Was an evolution in physics and uh, in quantum mechanics, in particular, made by very, made very young person. And what was the biggest advantage? If you formulate it like this, it's not important for you whether it's a wave function of single particle depending on three coordinates or a function of two particles depending on six coordinates or a function of the whole universe with just the same vector that actually opened up a possibilities the possibility is to formulate advanced quantum mechanics formulate field series all beauties we will learn now because at this level of the abstraction it's not a function of coordinate anymore it's a vector in Hilbert space, and we can describe arbitrary complex system with the same format. It's also pretty much practical. Instead of uh, solving differential equation, we just use linear algebra, multiplication of matrices, diagonal uh, matrix and vector, diagonalizing matrices which gives you, for instance, energy spectrum of the Hamiltonian. Right. Um, let me get immediately to back to functions. Let me talk about representations of a wave function. OK, formally, what's a representation? We have a wave function, and we present it as a linear combination, superposition, they say, quantum mechanics, superposition of all vectors of a certain base, certain basis, right? C and B coefficients of superposition, 
and they can be formed by in uh, in a products one would just multiply both parts with n write them uh, as far as the vector is awesome uh, since the basis is orthogonal, uh, orthogonal you've got one only for a certain n right let's go for examples coordinate dependent wave function we have a basis of localized wave functions localized in each point and we project the vector the wave function on these basis vectors we got wave function in according to representation instead we could use plane waves which are eigenfunctions of momentum right we do the same we project this is summation uh integration uh kind of uh, implies summation that this is bra this is get all right so we have the same in the product it looks like for a transform and it is a for a transform so it is the same wave function but just presented as right so it's infinite number of bases so for each wave function we have infinite number of presentations uh, perhaps i can make it more uh, comprehensive if i just do it for two-dimensional vector two-dimensional vectors we all know so this is a vector presenting the wave function and i come with a coordinate system so what's that it's just a set of two orthogonal vectors fine what do i have to do i have to find projections one projection let's call it psi one no, oh, okay, I, I use C. Let's call it C1. Let's call it C2. Right. So just projection, uh, so as we did uh, well, in the Bay School, right? Projection of the vector. Well, uh, the idea is that we can take another base, this one. And in this base, the same wave function, you have different projections. So that's gonna be C2. That's gonna be C1. Good. So function representation is nothing but choosing coordinate system and projecting a vector from Hilbert space to this coordinate system very convenient natural basis for every hamiltonian is a orthogonal basis of eigenfunctions right remember each method you can diagonalize and you can do this with hamiltonian so we have a set of energy levels eigenvalues and set of eigenvectors eigenfunctions of the so if you know Hamiltonian, if you like this Hamiltonian, if you comprehend this uh, Hamiltonian, if you can live with this Hamiltonian, please use the natural basis, the basis of eigenfunctions of this Hamiltonian. Right, that was about representations. I hope you're with me. And now, there will be some new material. Although, if you, I guess most of you were exposed to uh, the book with a cat, right? Book with a cat. So these pictures are also in this book with a cat. I don't don't think they usually come uh, in the course. At least I didn't do this. 
Uh, but this Heisenberg picture is in that your favorite book. We will use these pictures quite a lot in the course. That's better. We put it on away now. It's also a bit evolutionary and difficult to comprehend. Let's do it now, but I stress that it's still a part of usual quantum mechanics. Just this part is not usually explained to you. Usually it is kept as a secret. Good. So, pictures. What are the pictures? Uh, in fact, what we just learned, what we just refreshed, is Schrodinger picture. In this case, wave function changes in time, moves, while operators usually stay the same. One can go differently and uh, say that what matters for us is expectation value, not the wave function, but and not an operator which presents the observable, but just the expectation value of this physical observable. Right. And it turns out that we can formulate quantum mechanics in completely different fashion, keeping the same expectation values, keeping the same physical quantities. How people do this, how Heisenberg did so. Uh, let's play a bit with the formulas. Let us compute time derivative of expectation value. <coughs> All right, if wave function depends on uh, time, right, we differentiate one wave function, we differentiate another wave function, Operator stationary, we are done. All right. Then uh, let us replace these time derivatives with Hamiltonians. All right. Remember what was that? We do it for bra, we do it for cat, and we will write the same formula as expectation value of a commutator. Right? One H appears here on the left side of A from time derivative of this part. Another H appears here on the right side of A from differentiation of this part. Altogether, we have a commutator. Fine. Then the big comes. Now we can just say that we have an operator which evolves according to this equation evolves according to the conditions. And wave function, function just stays down constant. In quantum courses, in quantum science, in quantum information theory, they put so much stress on the concept of wave function. This picture shows that in fact you don't need, no, don't need it. Instead, you can look at apparatus as type dependent matrices. Same physics, another tool set which we use in order to comprehend this physics. Right? That's actually explains why. At this picture. Quantum mechanics is an example of pluralistic theory. It does not set your methods 
it always gives you a choice of action. You can always adjust better approach, which better suits yourself, better suits the problem. Like in, uh, when you kind of live in society, where people different views, but work uh, on the same reality. They say they can cooperate, they can disagree. Doesn't matter. These views are in principle equivalent. Same with pictures. You can use any picture according to your views, according to your convenience. Uh, the problem by itself does not dictate you which picture to use. It's your decision. And eventually the number of possible pictures is infinite. Okay. Any Hamiltonian that can separate in two parts, H1 and H2, and uh, one can set a picture by letting H1 to evolve wave functions and letting H2 to evolve apparatus. And Schrodinger picture, and Heisenberg picture, just two extremes of this continuous spectrum of possibilities. All right, so pictures, we can use Heisenberg picture many times in this course. It's very handy, very compact, basically because you don't have to care about the wave function, you can concentrate on the apparatus. Um, all right, and uh, this is intrinsic property of uh, sufficiently complex physical series. You can proceed with different methods. But well, quantum mechanics is not unique, the same applies, for instance, to electrostatics, electrodynamics. When we can use different methods, different approaches, all the same problem. Fine. Did I get the message through? Seems like that, at least you don't work fast. Uh, let us see. Let's move to methods. Something that we use in the course. But again, it all be, it belongs to, to uh, uh, elementary quantum mechanics. Let's talk about perturbation theory. The point is that we can solve only a few special Hamiltonians precisely. Uh, if you cannot uh, solve formally, it would mean that we cannot say anything about those, uh, but we can. And to deal with this problem, we use a very powerful method in physics and math, a method of successive approximations, perturbation theory. How does it work? We have a complex Hamiltonian. We separate it in two parts. We do like this part. It is simple enough. We can find wave functions. We can find energy eigenvalues. Then we have an addition, and we can we treat it as a perturbation. Hamiltonian becomes complex, but M is small in a sense. So how we can use it? First of all, let's go to natural basis, convenient basis, the basis of the Hamiltonian H naught. And let's look for new wave functions as a superposition. made from the eigenfunctions of original Hamiltonian. Fine, we take it, we substitute it, we have an equation for coefficients of these superpositions. Then what we do next, we do it in successive approximations. Let me make a first step, zero approximation. In this case, this matrix is 
a just unity matrix. All vectors are the vectors of H naught. There's no N. Eh? There is a set of energies. Okay, let us substitute it. Let's look at the first order. Then in the first order here, we have correction to energies. Here we have unity matrix. And here we have again unity matrix. So we have diagonal matrix element of M. Do I have to remind what are matrix elements? I think I have to. Um, so, again, it's bracketing. This is the matrix element. You need two way functions, one operator, you got matrix. Right, so the first of the correction is just matrix element. We will uh, use many, many times in this course the formula for second order corrections. For instance, first order correction can be zero. We look at the second order corrections. It's already much more involved. It uh, involves matrix elements, squares of matrix elements. For all states, it involves energy differences between the elements. There is also a useful but less used formula for first order correction for a wave function. I guess it will appear in one of the problems. Fine. The point is that one can build up successfully perturbation theory second, third, fourth order, the formulas become more and more, more, more complex, but in principle one can elaborate it step by step. Fortunately for our course and for very many physical phenomena, we can stay up to second with the perturbation theory up to second order. Good, that was perturbation theory, very important method in quantum mechanics. Let's get to systems. Uh, qubit. Qubits of a terror in my age, so they're not qubits, right? What did people of my generation use for this example who remembers? Yes? Uh, even a simple Yes, precisely. Uh, electron spin. Uh, a spin one half can be in two states, up and down. And the simplest quantum system uh, involves two possible states. Okay, yes, me, let me forget what spin, let me talk about qubits, it's more uh, natural language now. So there are two states, logical zero, logical uh, one. And anyway, function is a superposition of the two with a non coefficient alpha and beta. Wave function is a two vector. Uh, right, let me sketch a physical example. Say I have a tensile this form. There are two wells. And uh, the wave function can be localized either in one well or another well. And that gives me two logical states, zero and one. Uh, there are two parameters. First parameter is a difference in heights between the wells. I call it epsilon. So one can make uh, one of the wells energetically favorable with respect to another one. There is also tunneling between the wells. So how do I put it into Hamiltonian? Hamiltonian is now is two vector matrix. 
because the system is simple, the Hamiltonian is simple as well, that epsilon, it comes as diagonal element for left or for right, well, and generally it's a non-diagonal element, it mixes two states, goes between them. I have to put it off diagonal. So I have got uh, a matrix to diagonalize, which you did a couple of years ago, but uh, many of you. So I, well, let me formulate it in politically correct fashion. I wonder how all, how many of you can diagonalize this matrix without Google. Astonishing. Everybody should be able to diagonalize this matrix by money. Please, I'm really serious about this. This is really a master which kind of rises your hand. It's very important master, linear algebra. If you cannot do this, you're done. You will be slave of a mud lab till the end of your life. So please, let's learn to, to, to diagonalize two beta matrices. Even if you don't remember, don't remember how to diagonalize it, perhaps you remember eigen values of this matrix. It's a simpler, it's just plus minus uh, kind of uh, sum of squares of these uh, elements, right? So there are two levels in this three bit, and uh, those are hybridized states. So each uh, eigenvalue corresponds to linear superposition of the uh, this logical state. Right. Good. So. Please, uh, uh, I kind of appreciate your honesty, but I'm, I'm really shocked. Please repeat the material first year. Please find eigen states, eigen vectors, two vectors corresponding to these energy levels. And we go further. Harmonic oscillator. Harmonic oscillator, it is a system which uh, is uh, also known to you. How to formulate it? We have the same potential energy as we used to, and we add parabolic potential. So it's a particle in parabolic potential. And if we look at it from one uh, from classical point of view, we know the answer to be the particle in parabolic potential will experience oscillations with a certain frequency. Funny enough, this frequency doesn't depend on the amplitude of these oscillations. It's a, we got it, the property of parabolic potential or approximation, because for very small oscilla oscillations with very small amplitude, each potential, each smooth potential, can be approximated with parabolic potential. Right? So that's why it is so widespread of a model. Good. So, Schrodinger equation we could have, we could uh, solve second order differential equation, Schrodinger equation to have this oscillator, and one learns that uh, energy levels are equidistant discrete and equidistant. 
quantization, classical particle would have continuous spectrum of energies, but here the spectrum is quantized. And units of quantization is precisely this uh, frequency, h bar omega. But one can get step by step, high, high energy. So one can accumulate quite some energy in this. Right. What is also special about oscillator? You can solve it very easily in classical mechanics because the resulting equations are linear equations. This is almost nothing to solve. Right. So it also has a tricky manifestation in quantum mechanics which will be explored in many details. But let me just present it at this stage as a trick, a way to solve harmonic oscillator without equations, without complex differential relations. So be ready for a trick. Again, I would not go through all details of this trick and just uh, uh, outline the most important steps. Uh, remember you know this trick is also in the book of the pack. Good book, actually. In spite of Esther's color. color. Uh, right. What is the first step of this trick? We have two operators, X and P, coordinate and momentum. And we want to make one operator out of that. This is not emission operator. It has real and imaginary part corresponding to operators of momentum and coordinate with some coefficient. One can take conjugation of this operator. Just the same, you know, what is the change is the sign. Two operators. The coefficients are chosen in such a way that the commutator of this operator is one. Commutator, you remember that? It's actually a a bigger minus a bigger a. Right, and it's always one. Right. What one can do? One can express x and p out of A and A dega, because it's linear relations, it's easier. One can put it back to the Hamiltonian, right? And that's what we have. A simple form of Hamiltonian in terms of operators A. A dega times A plus one half. We will repeat all that extensively in advanced quantum mechanics, just uh, I'm using it at the moment as a trick. Then one can prove the following. Suppose we have a state, we don't know whether what's the energy of the state, we don't know what form the state it is. But just we know that there is a state of this Hamiltonian is energy in S. Then we can add <coughs> on this state with this operator A. And that will give us also an eigenstate of this operator with a shifted energy, with an energy shifted by H omega. But to do this again, exercise a little max, mus, uh, muscles actually do this substitution, see that. All right. 
right. Then we kind of have a little bit crazy picture. It seems we can start with uh, any state. And we can go up or we can go down. That suggests that the spectrum of the circulator is unbounded and one can have positive and negative energies. That seems so, but is it really true? Huh. We have positive potential energy, we have positive kinetic energy. That cannot be true. So the trick doesn't make sense. Wait a second, it, it does. Yet another small trick. It might be that starting some state, this state, I just cannot go down. What does it mean? If I will try to lower energy, I would not get a function which I can normalize. If so, if I get zero, I can stop this moving down. We have proved that there was ground state of the oscillator determined by this equation of a state. Which is called vacuum in application of the Now there is a little piece of job to do is to substitute this state into the Newtonian and figure out that the energy of the state is h omega divided by h bar omega divided by two. That's it. We correct it without knowing anything about wave function, just using. Who knew that? Good. Much more people than been able to diagonalize to by two metrics. Well, uh, good. Good. So I explained this trick. Let's see how I'm doing with respect to time. Oh, not that bad. Let me jerk about density matrix, which again, if you ask me, also belongs to usual quantum mechanics, but we will use it several times and also conceptually, it is very important. It's again somehow uh, a right denial of wave function. You can be quantum mechanical without knowing wave function, you can be quantum mechanical with something else. Density matrix. But it is convenient to uh, define it with the help of wave functions. So density matrix, as the name suggests, it's a matrix. It is a matrix in Hilbert space, but it's not an operator. It's something that characterizes wave functions. But it's a matrix has the same structure as an operator. Uh, it comes, it uh, is explained, uh, it, it explained in two facets. First facet is uh, statistical ensemble. Suppose we have many systems like electrons with spins, and each can be in one of the states labeled by I, for instance, plus minus. 
how we can characterize such a symbol, many systems. Well, we can say that spins are up with some probability, spins are down with some probability. That's it. That will make a density matrix. So we'll, we'll take a corresponding bra and cats of these states and multiply it with probabilities. So if uh, both uh, probabilities are the same, if spin second of uh, can look in arbitrary uh, uh, direction, what kind of matrix we will have? Let's make it so this is uh, plus. So this is this matrix element. Probability 50%. This matrix element, probability 50%. This would be density matrix of such an example. It's not quantum mechanical yet. Let's have spin in X direction. So we have and all electrons are aligned with x axis. So we will have to use different basis functions, which are linear combinations of those. So instead of spin up and spin down, we will use spin to the left, spin to the right. I want your uh, rotational matrix corresponding to, to transition from one pair state to another state. Just uh, let you know that density matrix or all particles in X direction actually will be like this. Probabilities to have spin up and spin down are the same. 50%, but mat non diagonal matrix elements are present. Here they are. It's a matrix of fully parallelized state in X direction. So that's one of the examples, one of the uses of density matrix. In this case, we have plenty of small systems, plenty of particles, and we want to say something about the whole ensemble. A complementary view on density matrix is a concept of partial chains. Um, I will do it a little bit abstract way because I don't have much time. Uh, usually, I, uh, if you wish, I will explain more on coming Monday when we have uh, the problem solving session, which will be devoted again to refreshing of quantum mechanics we will give presentations of different aspects of it uh, right uh, let me do it a little bit abstract level. we have a system which has which is made of two subsystems for instance two particles with different speeds right so each eigen uh, vector can be presented as a product of uh, states in these two subspaces. Right. Let me form density matrix which corresponds to pure wave function in the whole system. Here it is. Let me rewrite, it's again um, not messing indices in large sums. So what I want to have here, I have different i's, different g's for brass and cats. 
So in total, I have four indices. And I have superposition coefficients corresponding to these four indices. Now, what I want to do is something very human. I would like to forget about one subsystem. Well, or I don't want to care about this. Suppose I have a particle with two coordinates, x, y, and I don't want to know about y whatsoever. That would kill my wave function into, uh, into uh, dimensions. But I can cope with density metrics, right? So how do I do it? By partial trace. I will sum up in this formula over all, all uh, J indices. So I will have all the states in subspace I, right? So I do it with this pure state with a wave function and I can have some with some density matrix in I basis. In this case, the system remains unique in distinction from statistical ensemble where I have a plenty of those. But the concept is essentially the same. It's a density matrix which appeared because I didn't want to know about certain components of wave function. Very convenient, practically, we engineers, we don't have to uh, take into account intensity of ultraviolet uh, irradiation on moon surface when we uh, design our machines, right? We want to forget about many things. And density matrix formalism gives us disabilities. Let me shortly um, that's actually my, uh, one of my favorite multiple choice questions. Did I say that examination is just an open question, a problem to solve, and second part is a must, uh, multiple choice questions. All right. Uh, it's a large hint that uh, um, there will be an answer to a multiple choice question. And this is the general properties of density metrics. First of all, normalization. Diagonal elements of density metrics are probabilities. Sum of all probabilities has to be one. Expectation value, which you made from two functions, you can make it the same way with density metrics. Uh, you just arrange uh, this. Um, grass and cats in a different way. So you arrange it as uh, like this, trace. That will be density matrix. So expectation value is the trace of the rate of times density matrix. What else? Purity. <coughs> Purity is uh, Density matrix is called pure if it corresponds to a pure wave function. If a uh, wave function is pure, if, if it's the case, a um, uh, matrix can be presented like this. If we multiply it, how do we multiply it? Oh, we just repeat it again and again. And this is one. So squared is eventually the wave function itself. Okay? It's called purity criterion, and one can introduce the concept of purity of density metrics. So for pure state, it's one for very margin, it's close to zero. Um, fine. 
Uh, I told once that uh, each physical quantity is an operator, a linear operator in Hilbert space. I, I hope you still remember this. It's not like so. There are physical quantities which are not operators, which are very difficult to fit in, in quantum mechanics. One of these quantities is pretty known from statistical physics, it's entropy. Entropy is a nonlinear function of density matrix. But could think of uh, operator entropy, which is log of density matrix. But still, since it depends on density matrix itself, it's not a uh, eligible, uh, it's not a legal quantum equation. But in principle, if one wants to know entropy, it is given uh, by density matrix with this one. Fine. It's also interesting, and there is a nice, simplest presentation. Um, I'm talking about student presentations. Uh, about this is that dynamics of density matrix can be defined without looking at the wave functions. So one can just write evolution equation of the same sort for density matrix immediately. And well, uh, let me confuse you a bit. It It looks very much like equation for, it looks a bit like Heisenberg equation, right? Derivative of the operator commutator. It is not. Sign is wrong. And density metric is not an operator again. It's just uh, something more, much more close to wave function. So it's separate equation. It's not Heisenberg equation. It's an equation for dynamics of density matrix. Ladies and gentlemen, it looks I am done with this lecture. So I hope I will see you on Monday. Thank you very much for your attention for attending this course. Thank you, Zoom participants. I have finished this session.